Hi everyone, my name is Vladimir and I'm here to give you my talk called Aesthetic Driven Development or basically how we started making an art before we made a game, uh, how it worked out for us and how you can do the same. So before we actually proceed, I wanted to give you some background information on who I am or rather who we are. I run a studio of two people called Cold Wild Games. It is located in Riga, Latvia and my partner Helen, she does art and writing and I do pretty much everything else. Uh, occasionally we hire freelancers to do the music for us. We've been making games since 2016 and we also own a pair of cockatiels or weirdo birds for our Australian friends. Uh, the cage is a metaphor for us working from home even though they leave it much more often than we do. And all further images and tweets in this presentation were made by Helen. That's her Twitter handle there below. Anyway, so to give a bit more background, before 2019, the game development processes for us was rather straightforward. We would build a prototype that we enjoyed playing, then we would start figuring out the graphics, essentially it turned out into the game. We've made three more or less serious games up to this point, and um, they had a very moderate success. For what it's worth, our most successful game called Lazy Galaxy has achieved 6,000 sales over two years. And I suppose some of you who might be watching this presentation, they might cry over those numbers. And uh, that's all right, actually. Uh, I still think it's not, it would not be enough to maintain the studio, sustain the studio by itself. So the move was to change the approach. And one of the things that we did in 2019, rather than start building a prototype with gameplay in mind, we focused on aesthetics and art first and found out what our audience liked. Uh, and to fast forward a bit, the game has sold around 10,000 copies in seven months. So the real bankruptcy that is threatening us is the moral bankruptcy probably and the only one so far. So I actually believe this happened before because we focused on creating the attractive art first before we actually begin making the game. And in this talk, I'm, I'll try to outline the process and approach of how we did it and how you can systematically try to do the same. Right. So first of all, in 2018, while I was porting the game, uh, our previous game to consoles, Helen did not have much to do, and uh, I just essentially told her to draw in the octobit trend, which started in October, which basically involved environment as a subject, and uh, each daily image would require an artist to draw a painting using more colors than before. So there was a color limit. There was also a time constraint on one day to make an evening, to make a posting. And for most days, she tried to post it on one time. At one similar time, it was in the evenings. So that both European and American audiences would see it. Uh, but since I treat the games as an art more than a business, but at the same time, I don't want to dry of hunger, I decided to approach this whole thing as an experiment to see where it leads to us. The idea is to make something that everybody likes, us and uh, people who would play our games and then to see if the game can materialize. Right, so after this, if we treat it as an experiment, we need some sort of a criteria to mm, evaluate the results. And uh, I think we've created well, I've created four different things that I want to evaluate the games, uh, the art with. First of all, I think we both of us need to like something that has been created because uh, as a studio of two people, it makes sense that both of us would like working on something together. And I think for the smaller indie studios, it's much easier to come to an agreement and to find something that everyone in team is passionate about. Afterwards, uh, we would look at the response on Twitter. How has the image been perceived? 
at every slide, I will try to give the amount of likes, retweets, and comments, uh, how about user reaction and how they would like the image or not. Overall, the ease of creation also matters because if you think about it, we're a two people team, so we would need a way to make hundreds of assets together, uh, either to establish a sole asset production container or just to include our limitation to create the quality games, uh, pick whichever you like out of this two. So we really wanted to have a chance to create the art that looks decent, but would not take so much effort that we'd never publish a game. Afterwards, we would also consider the game design constraints because even if the image is created, it kind of implies the style of the game that you can come up with and not images are equally appropriate for different game types. And we don't like all the genres. So uh, we have those four things, but what are the baselines? I think it's hard to measure liking or disliking images by themselves. So to take it as a baseline, our usual game-related tweets had maybe under 20 likes, one or two comments, mostly from our friends, thank you, and uh, one to five retweets. And I wish I'd say I was cherry-picking those ones here, but to be honest, this is what the usual tweets look like. I kind of like them, but I'm the biased guy here. So the idea is we would look for everything that is better than that at the time. Helen had roughly 500 followers at the start of the experiment and close to 1,000 or a bit more at the end of it. So how did it go? I'll try to give some descriptions uh, of the images that turned out and why they did or did not work out. And uh, for example, let's start with this one. I call this the forest hut. Let me move myself here. So this is the forest hut and I think both of us liked this one. The response was also pretty good with 72 likes and 12 retweets. Uh, but if you think about it, it's not easy to create something like this. First of all, first of all, this is an isometric perspective and pixel art is kind of harder with isometric perspective. And plus the amount of details here is a bit, well, that's a lot of detail to be honest. So, even though we could imagine it being a part of some tactical RPG game, it's ultimately a pass for us because we would not be able to afford to create a game like this. Everyone's situation is different, but this is how I would evaluate it. Then we had a stork, and personally, I'm a huge fan of the birds. I think Helen likes birds too. And the stork had a good amount of likes and retweets. But again, this color palette was... It was kind of tricky to make it right. But even then, the resolution is lower the pre than the previous images. But what kind of game do you imagine yeah, with this asset? Maybe it would be a decent puzzle game, but it's not really our genre and who makes non-erotic puzzle games in 2020. So that's a no. Next, the market. So we liked it. And I personally really like the vibrant colors and uh, overall it just seems aesthetically pleasing to look at plus it was not very hard to make but what killed this one was the amount of attention because only 33 likes and one retweet comparing to what we've been getting before was clearly not enough for us to actually consider it as a possible game art even though both of us liked it next are the ruins and I personally did not like it that much, so opinions were different, but it had a lot of attention. But then again, on the other side, I don't think it would be easy to create this because of the higher resolution and the amount of detail. So that's a pass. In the end of the experiment, we had a few images that would fit as the game sprites. And I wanted to go through some of those concepts just to show the way how I think. First of all, two of them are isometric, which as you might have guessed from before is a point of skepticism for me, but I'm not against isometric images per se. If we look at the windmill on the left, 
or is it water mill? Yeah, this is the water mill. If we look at, at the water mill on the left, uh, it still looks kind of generic despite the good reply and uh, you would probably not remember looking at it. The waterfall is a bit more appealing, but again, it's hard to imagine the type of game that I would put it into. On the other hand, why we like the temple, uh, there are a few reasons for that. First of all, the temple offers the unique style and for the artists who only start to do something like this, for us, we are really struggling with the style for our games because sometimes you feel like you can draw but it's not really memorable enough or distinguishable enough and finding the right style for the artist is the real struggle and we still haven't figured it out in the end but it felt like the right step on the, in the right direction. Plus, if you think about it, the temple consists of small replicable geometric shapes that you can use for other types of buildings or the world. So ultimately, I think in this case, the temple was a goal for these reasons. So we like the floating temple and uh, what do we do next? For me, I don't feel comfortable diving into the project right away. And I think it makes sense to do some more experimentations without huge commitment. And for us, the logical step would be the take idea further. And Helen spent a few hours to just draw how the trees of this world would look like. And she put it on Twitter again with more relevant tags like pixel art and game dev at that point. And it still got a pretty decent response, very decent for us, 105 likes. That kind of validated the idea and served as a positive sign to show us that we may need to pursue the idea further. The next and somewhat a final step before creating the actual prototype for us is to commit even more of our time and resources, and resources into this. Helen drew ships and some more potential islands, how they would look in the game. We combined them into small sequences of presumably gameplay gifts or concept art. Let me move myself. And every one of them had quite a bit of attention. I mostly made those gifts on my Saturdays and Sundays and posted them on Screenshot Saturday just to see how people responded. And response was quite well. In total, we spent roughly two months for this whole process. It was uh, 25 work days before, between drawing and choosing, then roughly 15 part-time days to validating our idea further with those GIFs. And uh, I think overall those 40 days is a bit more than 25% of the time that we spent on the project together before the early access launch. And I think I treated it as an investment and you should too if you do something like this because uh, it allowed us to find the audience for the project before we actually started to working to work on it. And in the end, it just allows us to work on something that both we and audiences want. Of course, if you can afford it, expanding this window of finding art is definitely worth it, I think, because the this can be beneficial and open, open more options to you. Of course, you still need some constraints to stay focused because, for example, I don't think I would do it more than three months in advance because there should be like the stop sign and find point where you decide I like this art and we should give it a go. Anyway, so we have the art and it becomes clear that audience really likes this style and want more. So what actually happens with the game? And I think at this point you really need to acknowledge the potential art style effects on the gameplay right from the start because uh, in our case, like you see this horizontal building overlay and display. Uh, I was maybe thinking of something like Kingdom at the start, but I wanted to make a more complex building chains and it becomes clear that you cannot have a lot of those buildings on screen at the same time. So you cannot put a very complex production chain into the game with limited screen space because then player would need to scroll around the screen a lot and it definitely affects the gameplay experience and user experience and uh, I was against it. 
If you think about, we also wanted to create it as a non-violent game, just our preference. But if you consider the mm, combat-based game prototype, then 2D combat, even if it is if it, if it is strategic game, can become quite limited. So overall, I think hitting the right notes with art might seem like a treasure, but if you can find the gameplay ideas with it, if we would not be able to find the fun gameplay ideas with it, we would not continue it. But limiting the amount of buildings to six or seven per screen did wonders for us because that allowed us to look for other options. So the constraint is what game would you make if you had six or seven buildings on the screen or on the level at the same time? And I think it contributed to the next step for us. So we can't have many islands, those small islands on one screen, and but we still want some sort of a management game. What do we do? In our case, we added this map as a sort of a glue to connect the islands together. And it really added this exploration aspect into the game, which made the map exploration and trading way more fun because players would be able to find different spots in the map with different prices on the goods and then sell them or buy them in a profitable manner. The map with free movement also allow us to add more quests or just more memorable islands that would not serve a lot of the gameplay purpose, but more of an experience purpose, because we want players to experience the game. And so overall, I think this glue worked because of the constraints that we've set, first from the art style and then from our own artificial constraints based on this island amount per screen. And I realized that if you look at this presentation, you might think, wow, this has been easy. Like, you can figure those things out. And uh, maybe you are right, but for us, it was a real struggle to come up with something that is both pretty and uh, playable, because I don't want to take away the fun from the gameplay, but it sometimes is still very hard to come up with something potentially fun for other players. Anyway, so you have something that people like, and what happens next? For us, since it became clear that audience likes what we are doing, we've tried to capitalize on those pretty graphics and we've created the Steam page, I think two or two and a half months after we started actively developing the game. At this stage, we just made a simple 30 second trailer from all of the features that we had in the game at that point, rather in the prototype. And there were five screenshots, but the point was to start gathering wish lists. So we've published the Steam page and as soon as we had something new, we would post it on Twitter and update the Steam page with screenshots. Thus, it would lead people to wishlist the game or just get us more attention of the game. Another vital point for me was the remake of trailers. The first trailer was really very simple, but then uh, as time progressed, I was updating the trailers, re-uploading them, re-announcing them, and it also gave us a bit more media coverage. If I can say the word media, mostly it's people were retweeting it or just looking it on YouTube. So I think the innovations were a good thing. On the downside, I think we had some of the complaints that on game launch it was that people have seen everything on our Twitter before they've launched the game. But it was the minority. And actually, that's a valid argument. And we've tried to be more secretive about our development later on. So... We have a Steam page with directed audiences from Twitter, from Screenshot Saturday, from pixel art tags to our game. And uh, also the Weather Factory Studio helped quite a lot with their Twitter exposure. So in the end, when the game was nearing its launch, uh, we had five, roughly 5,000 wish lists in five months. And we launched the game in early access. What happens then? The results were quite good because we had close to 6,000 sales in first two months. It hit 10,000 sales by January 2020. So we also got covered by some bigger YouTubers, which I've never dreamed to be covered by. And uh, our community has doubled in size, which sounds way cooler than it is. It was 150 more people who we all like. <clears throat> and I didn't run any paid marketing. Maybe, no, I've run some ads on Facebook and on Reddit. Overall, it was under $20 total. 
So I mostly relied on organic marketing. I think having a pretty style uh, allowed for this because otherwise it never worked for us before in the same manner. So you might be thinking about it and feeling like we've shot in the dark, hoping that we would hit something. And you might be true. So these are not tested suggestions or improvements, how I would try to adjust the process if I do it again, when I do it again, rather. So first of all, I think setting art constraints would make more sense. For example, if you ask your artist to only draw RTS units, or if you're talking about pixel art, you might also set the resolution, maybe don't make sprites more than 64 by 64, and I'm still stretching it. That's too much, actually, but yeah, it's really up to you. Also, as I mentioned before, the longer experimentation would probably mean a bigger pool of potentially successful results, but it also implies higher costs for you. The other thing that was mentioned by me in the beginning, mm, I think it was the Kickstarter, just to validate your idea, but now if you ask me, I never had a chance to run a Kickstarter from Latvia, but if you ask me, I think Kickstarter should be launched together with the Steam page, together with list. So Kickstarter is still the next step, yeah, a bit further after you've validated your idea. Maybe if you want to clean, have a cleaner results, avoid tagging popular accounts like Pixel Dailies, because a retweet by them would mean an influx of likes, but it would also skew your data and statistics in not so favorable manner. So you would not be able to make a good decision. Also, the last slide is viewer discretion. I was thinking maybe I should put it on the first one, but I think it makes sense if I talk about it in the end, when you know all the context. So after I posted something similar on Reddit, there was a comment that I'm the manager type who doesn't know much. And then I complained to my friend and then my friend said that it makes sense. And I actually agree with it now because essentially what I'm trying to present to you is the sample size of one, which worked for us. And what is the guarantee that it's going to work again? Nonetheless, here are my, some of my arguments why, which I would use to counter this argument. First of all, uh, we've made a few games before that did not use this process and it did not work out as well for us. This is somewhat different than just drawing concept art because um, with concept art, you know what you are drawing, essentially. You know the ideas that you are going to have in your game. Here you just draw something and hoping that it would fit the game. But it's not necessarily a bad thing, at least not for us, if you want to approach it in a more artistic way. Uh, also, I think David Wheel, I hope I pronounced your surname correctly, but in GDC 2019, he had a good presentation where he also focused on marketing using visual aesthetics of the game. And I think it really worked for him. So if you want to do something like that, do your research and be careful. That's all I wanted to say. Overall, I think this will be it for me. Thank you very much. I know you cannot ask the questions directly during this time, or maybe you will can, you will be able to. But if you have anything, try to leave them in the com video comments and I'll try to answer them. Uh, there's this artist's Twitter handle if you have any questions for her or just want to follow her. Plus my email is, uh, yeah, that's my email. If you want to know something, try to write it. I usually answer without within two weeks if I'm not super burned out. So uh, overall, I want to thank you for watching this. Your comments or critiques are welcome. And I hope you have a nice year ahead of you and a nice life. Vladimir is out. Bye.